good morning, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, it's so good to see you. I'm, I feel so blessed that you decided to spend your Valentine's Day with me. That just means you love me so much that you want... No, it's not about me, but hey, I'm still glad that you're here. If you're watching us online, I'm glad you're a part of this service too, whether you're joining us uh, live at live.clc.tv or you're catching the replay on Facebook or YouTube, or you're one of the cool kids and you're actually watching this service in the CLC app. I'm just so glad that you're a part of this service as well. Now here's the deal. We're on part number two of what's more than just a six-week sermon series. It's really an all-church campaign as we're all moving in the same direction together in unity. Because it's not just six Sunday sermons, but it's also uh, weekly uh, life groups, weekly small group discussions, and daily devotional. And so we're just really excited about this season where we get to dive into this book and our goal, really, the simplest version of our goal is we want to fall in love with this book and, by product, fall in love with its author, right? That's, that's the point of this. So we introduced something to you last week or reintroduced it. This is the Bible Confession. We used to do this years ago here at CLC. And uh, I'm going to give you the count of three. We're going to put it up on the screens. And I would love to say this together. So grab your Bible, grab your phone, open up your Bible app, get ready, hold it out, and here we go. On the count of three, three, two, one. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. I'll boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. If that doesn't get you excited on a Sunday, man, this book is absolutely incredible. And so we're walking through the entire Old Testament in this series. And so we're breaking it up into six parts uh, these are kind of six time periods that we find in the Old Testament to kind of keep things as simple as possible. So last week, what did we talk about? We talked about the beginnings, right? And that was the entire book of Genesis. And today, we're going to be moving into the second part. But last week, we learned about Abraham and the God of the promise. Because that's really what we're doing in this uh, Sunday messages is, is discovering more about God through Scripture. And so we were introduced last week to the God of the promise and we learn that he is not just a promise-making God, he's a promise-keeping God. And the key to unlocking every promise that God has for you is found in where? It's in your obedience. Your yes is the key to unlocking the promises of God. Now today, we're going to be jumping into the second time period in your Old Testament. And this is called the wanderings. And uh, you can probably figure out, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, figure out what that's about. It's about the wanderings, right? This is the time period from the death of Joseph in Egypt, the life of Moses, all the way till Moses' death right outside of the promised land as the people of Israel are uh, in captivity and then they're wandering in the desert. And so we're going to take a look at this today. We're really going to focus on just the book of Exodus and really just the first few chapters. But then later in the week in your small groups, you'll actually be going over the four books of the Bible that this time period encompasses. And that is everybody's favorite when it comes to reading through the Bible in a year, right? We've got Exodus. There's some good stuff there, right? But then it kind of takes a turn, right? Then we get into Leviticus and everybody's favorite, Numbers. <laughs> And Deuteronomy. And honestly, for a lot of people reading through the Bible, this is like, if you can make it through those four books, you're golden. Like, you, you're going to just fly through the rest of the year. This really is the place where a lot of people get lost. There's a lot of confusing details, a lot of uh, rehashing the same things over and over, and it could be a lot. But we're going to focus in on just the book of Exodus. And where we start uh, in Exodus, we're about 400 years after Joseph has died. Okay, And Israel has gone from a family of about 70 people to an estimated total of 2 million people in those 400 years. That, that's, they were doing a lot of something. Uh, and so they're exploding with growth. And, and really, the God of the promise is doing pretty good on his second promise to Abraham, right? He promised Abraham that he's going to give him more descendants than the stars in the sky. 
And uh, two million's probably a pretty good uh, a start on that promise. But there's a problem, because they are now slaves in Egypt. And how many remember that that's, that's kind of a problem, because the God of the promise said, I'm going to give you a land of your own. And I don't think you can get much further than uh, being slaves in somebody else's country than the promise of a land of your own. And so we got a problem we got to work out. Because God's made this promise, but it feels like there's a gap, right? There's a gap between the promise that God declared and the reality of being slaves in Egypt. And, and it seems like this gap or this tension between the promise and the reality is insurmountable. Like, how are you going to go from being slaves in Egypt all the way to a land of your own? Well, allow me to introduce you today to Moses and the God of deliverance. The God of deliverance. This is the quality of God that we're going to be unpacking today. But before we do that, there's something else that I need to address. See, uh, sometimes when we read scripture, we have to ask the question, why is this here? Like, why do I need to know? And what's, what's the purpose of the Old Testament in my life today in 2021? And so here's the thing. The people of Israel are slaves to Pharaoh. And we have a very similar problem. It's a reflection of our lives today. See, we aren't slaves to Pharaoh, but we're still slaves, a lot of us. See, the Israelites' captivity in Egypt in the Old Testament becomes a symbolic representation of our spiritual captivity today. And we don't need deliverance from an evil king, but we still need another kind of deliverance. Because if we're honest today, all of us would admit that there is an area of our lives that if it wasn't in our lives, we'd be better. And I'm not talking about your kids when they're misbehaving, okay? But really, if we're honest, there is an area of our life that if it wasn't there, we'd be doing a lot better. And so we need deliverance from, we're going to categorize it in, in three places. It's going to be sins, wounds, and weights. Those are the things that we're needing deliverance from. Because sins, those are the things that God clearly outlines in Scripture as being wrong. Lust, greed, gossip. Addiction, anger, lying, cheating, stealing, murder, you know, the big ones, the, you know, the whole Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, right? And so there are sins in Scripture, things that go directly against the will of God. We're bound by that. We also could be bound by our wounds. Now, these are things that we didn't cause. It's not no, any fault of our own. It's not a sin. But there's something that happened in your life that has left a wound. It's left a scar. It's left some damage. And... And it's so hard, just the memory of that event or that memory of that person can hold you in captivity and keep you from progressing in the life that God has for you. Those are the wounds. And then there's weights. And, and, and Paul describes it like this. He says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And there's some things in our lives that they're not sins, but they're just not beneficial. And those things are, are holding us back. They're keeping us from everything that God wants for our lives. Your finances could be a weight, right? Maybe there was a, a moment in your life where you made a poor financial decision and now you have become a slave to the lender, right? Scripture talks about that. Or maybe, maybe it's a habit, right? And it's not a sin. Like Netflix isn't a sin, but the amount of Netflix you watch may be a weight in your life. And I'm, I'm stepping on some toes, but, you know, there's some things in our lives that can just be holding us back from all that God wants for us. Hebrews 12.1 says, let us strip off every weight not just some of them, but every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Because here's the thing that we need to understand. God has a path for your life to run on. But you can't run on it as long as you are weighed down by those sins, those wounds, and those weights. As long as you are still in captivity, you'll never experience all that the God of the promise has for you. So last week is really a setup for this week. See, there's a passage in Psalms that I love. This is one of God's promises to you. He says in Psalm 92 that the righteous will flourish like the date palm, long-lived, upright, useful. They will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, majestic and stable. And planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. And I think there's too many believers, too many Christians, too many of us in this room today that we have settled for surviving when God has declared that we're going to flourish. And we're just trying to survive COVID. We're just trying to survive politics. We're just trying to survive 2021. We're just, we're just trying to make it to heaven. If we can just get to heaven, it'll be all right then. But God wants so much for you on this side of eternity, right? He wants you to flourish. 
not just survive. But we can't do that as long as we're in bondage. It kind of reminds me of this place called Death Valley. Anybody ever hear about Death Valley? This is, this is a ridiculous place that actually exists in our country. It is the hottest place on earth. In fact, here's, here's a sign uh, uh, outside of Death Valley. Can you throw that up on the screen? Caution, extreme heat danger. Like living in Chicago, I have never seen that sign before. Extreme heat, I kind of want to visit today just because it, the opposite of this cold would be kind of nice. But it's called Death Valley because this is what it looks like. Let's take a look at the next picture. That's Death Valley. Nothing grows. There's just, there's no life. There's no wildlife. There's, there is absolutely nothing. It's dead. And for a lot of us, this is kind of what our life looks like. Maybe it's our spiritual life, and it just, it's, it's dead, and the bondage, and the, the sins, and the weights, and the wounds, and all the stuff, we kind of just look like this. But take a look. They threw it up a little bit earlier, but it's all right. This is the same location. This is the same spot. This is Death Valley. But here's what's so cool. Every once in a while, like once a decade or so, I think this picture was from 2005. There's something unusual that happens called a super bloom. And it happens when there's just a little bit more rainfall than normal. In fact, this picture was taken after seven inches of rain. Only seven inches of rain caused this super bloom to happen. Those wildflowers are gorgeous. There's some orange ones in another picture I don't have, but man, it's, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And here's what they, they learned. Death Valley isn't actually dead. It's dormant. And below the surface are the seeds that can produce this. But they just need a little shift in environment. They just need a little bit of extra help, just a little bit of water, and this sprouts. And the, the reality of the parallel, and you can take that picture down, but the parallel for our lives today is that your life may feel like Death Valley, but below the surface, everything you need to flourish is right there. And all you need is just a little shift, a little, just to be set free from a couple of things in your life. And when you walk in freedom, it's like the refreshing rains of the Holy Spirit. And boom, wildflowers, gorgeous. And your life is a super bloom. And so as we're wrestling with this, though, a lot of us, we're kind of like Israel. See, Israel was experiencing this tension between what God had promised them and what they were experiencing. And for a lot of us, we have that same tension in our life between Death Valley and Super Bloom. And it's like, you know, I know that God has promised this flourishing life, but I'm, I'm in Death Valley right now, and it doesn't look like that. And there's this tension between the promise and your experience. And while there is a promise, there's also a process, Okay. And you'll never experience the promise if you don't first submit to the process. So that's what we're going to do with the rest of the time we have. We're going to look at the process in Exodus uh, to see what we can learn. Because when, when you're in bondage, who better to set you free than the God of deliverance? So that's who we're going to be introduced to today. So Moses is born in a very interesting time period. Uh, Pharaoh is terrified that the Israelites have become so large that if an enemy attacks them, all of the Israel slaves are going to turn on them and join the attackers, and they're going to take over the city. So Pharaoh comes up with this great idea. He's like, you know what? We can do population control by killing all the boys. We'll let the girls live, but all the boys that are born in the Israelites' families, we're going to kill them. And Moses is a boy. And Moses is born during this decree. And so what happens is his mother looks at him and says, this baby is special. Probably like every mother in this room has looked at their child and said, this one's special. And so she tries to hide him in secret for a few months, and then eventually she knows it's going to be found out. So she puts him in a basket, places him in the water, prays over him and says, God, just help him, protect him, guide him, be with him. And she pushes him down the river, and his, his big sister kind of watches from a distance, kind of follows the basket. And guess where Moses ends up? in the house of the guy that's like, we got to kill all the baby boys. And he has to end up raising an Israeli baby boy. Like, I love how God works. Like, God will take all the bad things in your life and just be like, nah, watch this. Right? I'm going to take the guy that wants to kill all of them. I'm going to make him raise the one that's going to deliver everybody. <laughs> like, I just, I love, God's just, he's cool. Uh, and so Moses is raised uh, by the Egyptians, uh, learns to read and write and do all the things that the Egyptians do, learns to lead like an Egyptian. Uh, but at the core of who he is, he knows he's an Israelite. He knows that he's not really uh, an Egyptian. And so then uh, there's this moment where Moses' anger kind of gets the best of him. You kind of see this repeated throughout his life, his anger issues. Uh, but he sees uh, an Egyptian 
slave master whipping or beating uh, an Israelite. And Moses loses it and goes out and does the very godly thing and uh, murders this guy. It's like, and this is who God chooses, right? So like whatever you've been through, whatever mess ups you've had, don't worry, God can still use you. Um, and so he takes Moses, or Moses kills this guy, gets terrified he's going to be found out and punished. And so he uh, runs out of Egypt, escapes, and becomes a shepherd in the wilderness. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. And by this time, Moses is about 80 years old. He's been living his life uh, no longer as a, a Jew, no longer as an Egyptian. Now he's just a random shepherd. And this is what we're going to read in Exodus chapter 3. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. And this, this location is going to come up a lot in these next four chapters or four books. Um, and there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? That's crazy. I got to go see it. And so when the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. We're going to pause right there. One of, one of the most beneficial things that you can do when you're reading through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, to help you remember that there was real people that experienced these real moments is to put yourself in their shoes. And so that, that's how I read the Bible. Uh, I, I try and imagine, like, if I was there... What would I have done? How would I have behaved? And that's how I've come to the conclusion that I was not built for Old Testament times. Because, let me tell you, if that was me, first of all, I don't think I would have gone for a closer look at a bush that's on fire. Like forest fire, like danger, get out of there. But the moment that bush yells out, hey Brent, look, I'm not that fast anymore, but I bet I could beat every single person in this room off that mountain. Because, boom, I mean, I would have been gone. There's no way. So it's really good that I was not born in Bible times. Uh, but luckily, Moses had a different response. He says, here I am. And God says, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for you're standing on holy ground. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. And really, this is the first point that we have today, and that is that a God encounter is the catalyst to deliverance. It's the catalyst. Like, here, here's the thing. Moses' encounter with the burning bush is what sets everything in motion for Israel. And deliverance is a process that needs a spark. Like, it needs a catalytic moment that gets you in the right path, that gets you in the right frame of mind. And that catalytic moment is always going to be an encounter with the God of deliverance. If there's something in your life that's keeping you bound, that's holding you as a slave, that's holding you back, let me tell you today that one encounter with Jesus can change everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. And that moment with God, that moment with the God of deliverance becomes the catalyst, not just for you walking in freedom, but for Israel as well. As we keep reading, then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt. It says there, I have heard their cries. Here's the thing. The God of deliverance moves when you cry out. See, you've got to recognize your need for deliverance. And you've got to cry out to God. Right? Everybody knows the first step to solving the problem is admitting that you have a problem. Right? You've got to recognize that there's something that you need help and cry out to God for deliverance. As long as you've convinced yourself that the thing in your life is no big deal, that you could quit at any time, that everybody else has issues that are way worse than yours. Look, I, I've, I've been there myself. There, there have been times in my life when I'm trying to cover it up, make excuses, lie to myself, even just to completely ignore the bondage that I was in. And we all end up looking like one of my favorite memes. It's the uh, this is fine meme. You know, the dog in the house is burning down. He's just sipping his coffee like, this is fine. <laughs> no big deal. This is fine. And we live our lives like that. In fact, that's Israel. This, this image, this is Israel for 400 years. Hear that. 400 years, they're slaves in Egypt. And life is horrible. Life is miserable. And they're just sitting there going, eh, this is fine. No big deal. Until finally, after 400 years in slavery, they cry out to God. 
Could, could they have solved that problem a little bit sooner? Probably. We end up looking just like them. And I pray right now that if, if you're here, that you would have an encounter with the God of deliverance and it would, it would spark something in you to finally cry out and admit, like, this thing is a problem. This sin, this wound, this weight, it is holding you back from the flourishing life that God has for you. And I pray that that encounter with God today would spark something in you to finally cry out to the God of deliverance. Because the awesome news is that when you do cry out, God moves. Exodus 3.11 says that Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you. And the lesson we learn here is that the God of deliverance goes with you. Like he doesn't let you wander this path all by yourself. And knowing that God is with you can change your whole perspective on life. That no matter how trapped you may feel, the God of deliverance is right there with you. He's got a hand outstretched to you, just waiting for you to take it. And we learn that God goes before us. He stands beside us. He walks behind us. Like, he is all around us. We're surrounded, like we sang about today. And whatever situation you're in today, just know that you are surrounded by the God of deliverance. And he loves you so much. And he is always with you. And that promise that he makes to Moses to always be there, he keeps it. He keeps that promise with the people of Israel. And, and really, there's this, after this burning bush moment, there's a back and forth between Moses and Pharaoh. Right? This is where we get the ten plagues. Right? As, as God demonstrates his power, not just to Egypt, but to Israel. And I think that it was more important for Israel to see the power of God at work than it was for Egypt. But that's another conversation for another day. But Pharaoh finally gives in after the tenth plague, and he sends the people of Israel out of Egypt. And guess who goes with them? God does. It says in Exodus 13, the Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. And this allowed them to travel by day or by night, and the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. And I just want you to know that no matter what's going on in your situation, God's not going to remove his presence from your life. He's not going to remove it. And if you need deliverance, you cry out to him, and he's going to walk this path with you. And, and really that path, that, that is our last point today that we're going to spend the rest of our time focusing on. That's that the God of deliverance provides you with a path to finding freedom. There is a path for you to walk. Exodus 14, 15 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, uh, let me back up. So uh, Pharaoh has released the people of Israel. He's like, get out of here. I'm done with you. He's grieving based on this 10th plague we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and so the people of Israel are leaving, and then Pharaoh changes his mind. And so he starts chasing them. And now Israel is trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's armies. And it looks helpless, and they start crying out again. And they, I think they say something like, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Like, why did you have to bring us out to the desert to die? And so in verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. And I... Can I just pause right here with all of the love in my heart? It's Valentine's Day, and I love you so much. And I want to say this as gently as possible. But there are some people that need to hear this today. Stop crying. Just stop and get moving. Yes, crying out to God is part of the process. But there's other parts to the process. You can't just stop with crying out to God. And there's some people that get stuck in this repetition of life where we're just crying out to God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. And he's like, stop it. I've given you a path. I heard your cries. I'm moving in your life. I've already told you what to do. Just do it. And there's a time to stop the crying and there's a time to start moving. And I love you. I say that gently. But I hope the Holy Spirit is just punching you in the gut right now. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk right through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Verse 21, then Moses raised his hand over the sea and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. See, God gave Israel a path to their freedom, and he carved it right through the water. And God, through his word, has given all of us a path to freedom. And it's carved right in scripture for us. But we've got to walk 
that path, right? Here's the thing. One of the promises we mentioned last week is, Genesis, uh, is John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, I've come to give you life to the fullest, right? That's that flourishing life we talked about earlier. And you can't live that life as long as you are bound by the weight of sins, wounds, and weights. We need to know the God of deliverance and walk the path to freedom. That path has four steps. We're going to hit them real quick. We've got to recognize, repent, confess, and repeat. Okay? Recognize. We, we kind of hit this already. We'll just hit it real quick. Matthew 5, 3, God blesses those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for him. So, yes, there is a moment where you've got to cry out to the God of, uh, of deliverance, and he will move when you cry out. That first step is recognizing there's something in your life that's keeping you bound. There's something in your life that's not right. And that first step is, is saying, you know what? It's not fine. It, it's not okay for me to continue in this mess. The house is burning down around me. It's time to get up and get some water and put out the fire. And then we cry out to God and we say, help me. And then we repent. Luke 13, 5 says, unless you repent and change your old way of thinking, turn from your sinful ways and live changed lives, you will all likewise perish. And if you're trapped in sin today, repent. Cry out to God. Say, God, forgive me for this. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of making this mistake. I'm, I'm sick of it. God, forgive me. Now, for those of you that are here and you're like, but I, I don't have a sin issue, Brent. I got, I got a weight. I got a wound. Like, I'll admit to that, but sin's not my problem. I don't need to repent. Sure you do. You know why? Because repentance isn't just saying you're sorry. It's, it's actually not really even part of repentance at all. Repentance literally means to change your mind. And so if you are bound by wounds and weights, guess what? You do need to repent. You need a change of mind. Mark Batterson says it like this. He says, uh, what is it? Um, uh, it's our stinking thinking that's keeping us bound. Like, we need to change our minds, and that's what repentance is. Right? How does that work? Well, Paul tells us in Philippians. He says, finally, brothers or believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, right there. Somebody needs to underline that, pure and wholesome. That's the stuff you got to focus on. Whatever is lovely and brings peace. Somebody needs to underline brings peace because you've been in a lot of stuff that brings anything but peace. Whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, somebody needs to highlight that and just start praising God for the things in your life. Think continually, not once or twice, not every once in a while, not when things get really bad, but think continually on these things. I love the Amplified adds on there. It says to center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. That's what we've been trying to do uh, for, for my son, Jaden, on the front row. Love you, man. You know, Dad always talks about you in service. So I've, I've mentioned this before, but uh, my oldest son, he struggles sometimes with negative thoughts. And so we've been teaching him probably since he was, what, about five years old? We've been teaching him this phrase, change the channel, right? And when he gets caught in these kind of repetitious cycles of negative thinking and, and self-doubt and all that stuff, we, we tell him, hey, man, you got to change the channel, Right? You've got you to gotta shift your focus. Think about something better because when you get into that rut, when you start going down that tunnel, it doesn't lead to good places. So we've got to change the channel. And guess what? So do you. And so you change the channel by focusing on one of the things that Philippians 4.8 outlines. Maybe, maybe your project this week should be to memorize Philippians 4.8. Maybe you should put it as the lock screen on your phone so that every time you pull out your phone, you're reminded to change your thoughts. But we do need to repent because real repentance is an internal change of heart and mind that results in an external change of behavior. And that is the path towards freedom. But like most things in life, that change in behavior is not always easy. That's why we need step three, to confess. Now the problem is, most Christians are really good at step one and two, and then we skip three and jump right to four, and we just repeat the process. And so it looks something like this. We mess up and we go, oh no, I've messed up. God, forgive me. Two seconds later, oh, no, I've messed up. God, please forgive me. Two days later, oh, no, I've messed up. God, please forgive me. And it becomes this cycle of, oh, no, oh, God, oh, no, oh, God, oh, no, oh, God. And then we start wondering, like, why isn't this working? Why am I still in the mess? And we're going over and over again. We never really find freedom. We never really get healed. And the change of behavior never really happens. You know why? Because he step, skipped step three, and step three may be the most important of the four. See, 
The catalyst to deliverance is an encounter with God, but the path to walking in freedom is an encounter with people. James 5.16 says to confess your sins, not to God, but to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be what? So that you may be healed. See, healing doesn't come from telling God you're sorry. Healing comes when you get an accountability partner, when you get a trusted friend and you take off the mask and you say, look, this is the thing that I'm struggling with. This is the thing in my life that I know I need to get rid of and I need your help. Where do you find that kind of relationship? Well, you got to build it. And it it does take time. You know where the best place to get started, at least I think, best place to get started with that relationship is in a life group. Like, we set them up for you. Because life change happens in relationship. So get in a group. Because another way to put it is, we're only able to change through three things. Positive examples that you get from an encounter with people. Loving encouragement, which you get from an encounter with people. And accountability with others, which you get from an encounter with people. And that's what happens. That healing process is what happens when you have an encounter with godly people and not just an encounter with God. And you really need both in your life. So we recognize, repent, confess, and then finally we repeat because we're human. We mess up. We're going to get it wrong. Thankfully, God isn't looking for your perfection. He's looking for your progress. And so day by day, we draw closer to God, and we try to become more like Jesus. And when we mess up, we don't try to hide it. We don't try to excuse it. We don't ignore it. We don't say, you know, this is fine, sipping our coffee. No. We cry out. We recognize it. We cry out to God. We repent by renewing our mind, by changing our minds. We confess to someone in our group so that we can find healing. And then we keep repeating the process as often as we need to, as we inch closer and closer to Jesus. Paul writes about this process in Romans 7. It's a, it's a really awesome chapter in your Bible. He starts off saying, man, I'm messed up. I keep doing the bad stuff I know I shouldn't do, and I'm not doing the good stuff I know I should be doing. Like, this is just messed up. And this is the guy that wrote two-thirds of your New Testament. And, and then I love this in, in verse 24. He says, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Verse 25, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is equally true for you today as it was for Israel back in Exodus. And this is the thing that if you don't read the Old Testament, you miss out on so many beautiful moments. See, in Exodus chapter 12, the the tenth plague comes. So there's been nine plagues plagues up until this point. The tenth one is the death of the firstborn son. And this this death of the firstborn son is is really, it's a tie-in to other scriptures that talk about the wages of sin are death because this plague isn't just for Egypt. This plague will affect everyone, including the Israelites. But God gives them an escape hatch. Like he gives them a way out. And and it's called Passover. Uh, And so what happens is God says, here's what I need you to do. We've never done this before, but this... This is what I need you to do. I need you to sacrifice a lamb. But not just any lamb. I need you to sacrifice one that is perfect, that's spotless, that's blameless, no broken bones, no diseases, no sickness, not even a spot on its fur. It's got to be pure and beautiful lamb. And you're going to sacrifice that lamb, and there's a bunch of things you're going to have to do in preparing this meal and this bread and all this stuff. But the most important step is you have to apply the blood of that lamb to your doorposts. Down and across. And what I love about this moment is because this is the exact same thing that Jesus does for us. In fact, Scripture refers to him as our Passover lamb. In in fact, I love this so much. In the Old Testament, God says, you need to go find a lamb and do this. In the New Testament, God says, I'm going to give you the lamb to do this. Like, it's so beautiful, guys, and you'll miss it if you don't read the Old Testament. But in this moment, here's here's the parallel that's so important that you can't miss today. What would have happened to the Jewish boys, the firstborns, if they had killed the lamb, cooked the meal, made the bread, and done everything except applied the blood to their doors? What would have happened? They would have died. Because it was the application of the blood that gave the sign to the angel to pass over. That's where the name Passover comes. He would pass over their home. And here's the thing. You could have been in church your entire life. 
You could know the story of Jesus backwards and forwards. You could know it up here. But until you apply the blood of Jesus into your life, you'll be dead just like everybody else. And it won't even matter how much scripture you can quote. It won't matter how much prayer services you attended. It it won't matter how many sermons you've listened to at CLC. Until you have that moment where you apply the blood, it's for nothing. So here's what we're going to do right now. There's something else I want to share with you. We're almost out of time, but just, just in this moment. Could you just bow your heads, close your eyes? I want to, I want to give a moment of, of quiet, of, of time to process for people in the room and, and those of you online. If, if you're here and you're like, man, I, I don't think I've ever done that. I know about Jesus, but I haven't actually applied the blood. I don't even know what that looks like. Well, here's the thing. Scripture says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That is the application process. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. And so that's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to lead you in a short prayer. And, and in this prayer, what we're, what we're really declaring is, number one, we've sinned and we've messed up. It's the crying out to God. There's an aspect of repentance in that, saying, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to behave like this anymore. I want to change my mind on these things. But the most important step is saying, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. Jesus, you're, you're the one that's in control, not me. And God, I I surrender and I release everything to you and I ask for you to come into my life and change me. So that's what we're going to do right now. If you need to pray this prayer with me, just repeat after me or put it in your own words. Say, dear Jesus, oh, forgive me. I have messed up so much. I have sinned. I made mistakes. I'm, I'm a slave to all that stuff that Brent was talking about. But today, I'm crying out to you, God. I need something to change. Come into my life. Make me new. I repent. I turn from those ways. I turn towards you, Lord. So today, on Valentine's Day of 2021, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. Whatever you tell me not to do, I'm not going to do it. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Jesus, we just celebrate for a moment that, like that right there. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's the most important thing you'll ever do in life. But it really is just the first step. See, when, when we talk about God wants your life to flourish, he's got a path for you to walk. Like there is so much more that he wants to do in you and through you. And we need to learn and grow together. And so we've got some resources to help you on that journey. If you prayed that prayer with me, if, if you're ready, you can text the word LIFE to 708-998-4516. If you're joining us online, uh, they'll give you some instructions in the chat right now, a, a link that you can go to. And really in this moment, we, ju- we just have resources that we want to help you be able to walk this out. Before we close, I said the catalyst to finding freedom is an encounter with God. The path to walking in freedom is an encounter with people. And you really do need both. So for everybody here today, this is what we're going to do. When you leave today, if you aren't in a group, get in one, okay? If you are in a group and you need deliverance, you need freedom, here's what you're going to do. You're going to call somebody in your group. You're going to text somebody that you trust in the group, and you're just going to open up to them. And and you're going to do that today. Why? Because why wait till tomorrow if you could be free today? And sometimes the Bible just makes me laugh. There is some funny stuff in this book. Like, Pharaoh has a thing with frogs. It's really weird. Uh, Because it's one of the plagues that that God sends, and I've never understood why frogs. Like, that doesn't even seem like that bad of a thing, but I guess I haven't been around a lot of frogs. But maybe Pharaoh had a phobia with frogs, because for whatever reason, the frogs put him over the edge. Like, he was okay with the river turning to blood, and he was okay with the boils on his skin, but it came to the frogs, and he's like, nope. Not going to do it. You got you to get rid of these frogs. So he says to Moses, he says, fine, pray, pray to your God, call it to your God, have him remove the frogs, and I'll let your people go. And then Moses says, all right, cool, bet, we'll do that. When do you want me to pray to my God? When do you want me to ask him to remove the frogs? And here's Pharaoh's response. Do it tomorrow. Is that not funny to anybody else? 
Why would Pharaoh be like, you know what? I hate these frogs, but one more night's not gonna kill me. Sipping his coffee, this is fine. I need to get rid of these frogs, do it tomorrow. Why wait till tomorrow if you can be free today? Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till Thursday night when your group meets. Don't wait till Friday when your group meets. Call somebody today. Why wait? The catalyst is an encounter with God. So I'm, I'm going to invite the worship team to lead a song in just a moment. I want to pray for you first, though, that you would have an encounter with God, that it would, it would be the spark today for all of this. But first, Exodus 6. I, I, I think that there's some people that this is your moment, okay? Everything else I've talked about was good, but this, this is the moment you needed. I, I feel that deeply in my spirit. Exodus 6, verse 2 says, And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. This is, this is a powerful moment. This is an important moment as God is revealing something new about himself. He says, And I re reaffirmed my covenant with them under its terms. I promised to give them the land of Canaan where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of the people of Israel who are now slaves to the Egyptians, and I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has freed you from your oppression in Egypt. That is powerful, but that's not the moment. It's coming up. Verse 8. I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. That's not the moment. But this is it. Verse 9. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Maybe you're here today, and you refuse to listen anymore. You're too discouraged by the brutality of the slavery you're in. You've been bound for so long that you can't even imagine being free. You've been stuck in this place day after day after day, and it feels like Death Valley. Can I tell you right now that God is still moving, even in your discouragement, he's still moving? The people of Israel stopped listening, but God didn't stop moving. Verse 6 is right before God displays his power through the 10 plagues. This is the moment right before all of that begins. In their discouragement, God says to them, watch this. I'm still moving. I'm still active in your life. He is the God of deliverance. It is in his nature to set things free. And no matter how discouraged you feel today, no matter how tired or beat up or worn out you feel right now, the God of the promise, the God of deliverance, he's still active. He's still moving in your life. Don't quit now. Don't give up now. Your freedom is right around the corner. Father God, I just thank you for every single person in this room. I pray that you would just open the floodgates of your anointing and your presence in this place, that, that this moment of worship would be a catalyst that would spark something in us to cry out, to identify those things in our lives that are holding us back, that we would say, enough is enough, no more. I'm sick and tired of being a slave to this thing in my life. God, I need it out. Father, that in this moment of worship, we would have a genuine encounter with the living God. Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if
Amen. Amen. You can take your seats for a moment. I believe that sermon spoke to me. How many of you all believe that sermon spoke to you? I thank God that he had Pastor Brent spend 30 hours writing a sermon just for me. See, that's the God that I serve. He's an awesome God. Thank you, Pastor Brent. I appreciate your help. Um, let's get through a few announcements really quickly. Um, we're gonna um, put up on the screen the offering um, options. We have many ways that you could give to Christian Life Center. Uh, we have text to give, you could give through the app, you could give through the website, and we also have offering boxes in the back of the church um, that you can put your offering in. We thank you for giving. Uh, I work in the finance office and uh, 2020 was a very scary year. And we, uh, CLC has given tremendously to the kingdom of God and we were able to do such a great work in the kingdom changing lives here locally and internationally especially during a pandemic it was such a blessing that our uh, members continue to give so we thank you for that uh, pastor Brent mentioned about life groups life group uh, season has started we are in the second week of the walk through the Bible life group week one was awesome I encourage you if you are not part of a group to go to the website to register, to be a part of the group, um, go to go.clc.tv forward slash groups, register and get in a group. The workbooks for the Walk Through the Bible Life groups are in the lobby. Um, so please pick one up and join a group. Speaking of lobby, it's been nearly a year, almost a year since our lobby has been open. We have opened our lobby so that you can connect with each other. Um, please go to the lobby, check out the merchandise table, pick up your life group workbook, connect with someone. Please keep your face mask on and stay socially distant, but we want you to connect with each other. Um, so yeah, the lobby's open and I think that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, give it up for the lobby, there you go, it's <laughs> church. Um, so please stand so I can pray the blessing over you. Uh, we are going to continue to dismiss um, on my right side. I still haven't figured out what side that is for you all, but it's my right side. Uh, so follow the usher um, as you dismiss. Enjoy yourselves in the lobby. Please go out in the lobby and connect with someone. Here's the blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace. 
in Jesus' name, amen.